Hey guys, it's Dr. Hayes, and this is our video about categorizing the animal bride and bridegroom fairy tale type uh, that we're doing for our fairy tale unit this this next few weeks in class. So, um, in class, we're going to talk about Beauty and the Beast and uh, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, uh, and we're reading several versions of Beauty and the Beast, and we've already talked about the sort of timeline of how fairy tales developed and the different types. So this video is to just give you a background before you actually read Beauty and the Beast, um, the original tale uh, from the 1700s, and before you read Cupid and Psyche. Well, that's the that's the uh, the, the tale that inspired Beauty and the Beast. But you're going to read East of the Sun, West of the Moon, which is a um, an update of that tale. Before you read some of these original tales, um, I wanted to kind of go through um, some of the notes on the handout that you have about the actual index that's used by folklorists to categorize tales, folk tales of all types, and kind of explain how that system works and how it, it sort of informs our conversations about fairy tales and folk tales, um, because that's kind of that's going to sort of be the foundation of our conversation throughout this unit. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some things from the handout, at least the first couple pages for this video, and um, then we'll incorporate other things from the rest of the pages in the handout over the next couple weeks. Um, so I wanted to talk about the ATU index. Um, I have a little board here. So in case you are a visual person, the ATU, yeah, this is ATU, <laughs> the ATU index um, is a uh, folklorist tool. And ATU is the, stands for the last names of um, the men who developed it. So the last name, it's Arne, Thompson, and Uther. So the first guy, uh, Arne, was his last name. He sort of developed this categorization of all of the folk tradition right so he um he put out this book this was you know early 1900s i'd, I'd have to look up the, the original year um, i think it was in the 1920s but um he he sort of published this this study uh and categorization of uh folk tales and he came up with all of these you know just categories of based on genre and subject you know, if the tale has magic, if the tale involves an animal, if the tale involves a transformation of some kind, which is the kind that we're looking at. And um, so he, it, was, it was a way to sort of give uh, folklorists and people who were gathering tales and talking about them, it gave them a way to, to talk about the same kinds of tales across cultures. Um, because as you know, we've, we've talked about in class before, the you know fairy tales originally just were part of the oral tradition and similar types of tales cropped up in in different regions different cultures and but they all had similar elements uh, like um uh, a a sort of a transformed fairy godmother element there's the the uh, like an enchanted person put it to put to sleep element uh, someone who turns into a creature or is turned into a creature someone who's a creature who turns into a human uh, someone who can talk to animals there's all these different elements that sort of recur uh, throughout different kinds of tales and different kinds of uh, regions and cultures and a lot of them came up simultaneously in different parts of the world and so that's just sort of an interesting interesting phenomenon about how um, some very similar tales and tale types come together and come up and spring up almost seemingly independently of each other um so scholars sort of realized pretty early on that we needed a systemized way to talk about all these different tales and to realize it's not they aren't all different they a lot of them have uh, similarities so um, Arn kind of decided, you know, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna assign tail types. So it'll be, it'll have a categorization, and any sort of tale or story that we discover, or that someone turns in or reports or or collects, 
um, from their region, we can uh, we can put it in a certain category, and then, as you can expect, as um, more and more tales and more and more folklorists started to do their work and to get interested in this field, more and more categories were needed, more specification was needed. So that's the T part of the AT index, Thompson, and his part was in the 1960s. And so for the longest time, it was the AT index. Uh, folklorists and children's lit scholars and fairy tale scholars referred to the numbers of the AT index. That's what it mostly was. Um, and then this guy, uh, whose last name is Uther, um, just within the last couple few decades has added, um, he, ex he expanded the index to include more international and worldwide categories and tales that hadn't didn't really have a place before. And so uh, the AT numbering didn't really change. He just added um, several tales from uh, worldwide uh, locations and he added some categories for international categorizations of tales that um, didn't really have a place. So the it became the ATU index comparatively recently, and that's what most people call it now, is the ATU index. Some scholars who've been working in the field for a long time still say the AT index or AT whatever number, and that's just out of habit. Um, both of them are referring to the same thing. If you ever encounter them in scholarship or in your reading, AT index, ATU index, it's the same thing. Um, so uh, for our class, we're doing a case study for a few weeks to learn all about how fairy tales are studied and how fairy tales are discussed in the scholarly world. We're doing a few weeks um, and we're focusing on one particular tale, Beauty and the Beast. Um, and uh, so we're going to read different versions of Beauty and the Beast, the originals and some uh, updated retellings. You're reading a novelized version. We'll talk about movies and TV shows and stuff that have been inspired by Beauty and the Beast. Um, but before that, I want to talk about sort of the origin. So, um, Beauty and the Beast. So let's start at the, let's start broad. So the, the category ATU 400 through, um, oops, run a little bit. That one kind of smudged, but that's okay. ATU 400 through 459. That range, that category, is any sort of enchanted husband or wife or relatives. Sometimes it's an enchanted husband, sometimes it's an enchanted wife, and sometimes they're siblings. Um, those are usually the main categories. Um, we're we're going to be focusing on the enchanted husband because the beast is enchanted, but it's not always the husband. It's It could be husband or beloved or husband to be that's what a bridegroom is uh, you know someone who's the the uh intended husband the bridegroom uh so we will that's the animal bride and bridegroom so sometimes the enchantment is not always an animal like uh sleeping beauty uh falls under this category i have it on your handout uh, sleeping beauty is uh atu 410 uh, so it kind of goes toward the beginning of the range uh sleeping beauty is an enchanted wife or bride, uh, beloved, but she is not an animal. So not all of these turn into an animal. Um, uh, let's see, ones we aren't talking about. So uh, the ones we're, we're focusing on the bridegroom. And so the animal bridegroom, It's like writing in the on the board in the classroom, but um, I'm writing in it on it in my lap instead. <laughs> so ATU 425 is the animal bridegroom, uh, the hus the husband, the 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 male who has been transformed. Um, but that's. You know, it's it's some people call it like the Beauty and the Beast <laughs> story or whatever. And there's two variations of, of ATU 425, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, some other examples of um, some of these tales that we're not reading. Uh, so, for example, um, the Frog King, Princess and the Frog, um, the uh, Swan Maiden is is a version of a woman who's turned into uh, a creature. 
uh, the Swan, Ma Swan Maiden stories. Um, that's where their original form is not human as a creature, and then they're transformed into a human for part of the story. Um, other ones that might fit into this are anything to do with silkies. Um, that's a, a Celtic creature that, that's a seal that sheds its skin and becomes a woman and walks the earth. Um, you have the kitsune in Japan. They they are fox creatures that can turn into a person. Some traditions have dragons um, or maybe a, a kind of monkey or something like that that, that transforms into a human. Um, Shape-shifting type stories. Usually shapeshifters that go back and forth like werewolves and things are in, a, in another category. Um, the swan maiden stories are usually creatures who through some sort of a spell or curse or something like that are they shed their animal form and and uh, become human and some sort of there's some sort of a deal or some sort of a true love or something the beloved then has to either break the curse uh, usually with swan maiden stories they don't end happily ever after the 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 creature is only human temporarily and then goes back to their um creature form Honestly, the uh, the Little Mermaid, the the Hans Christian Andersen version of the Little Mermaid, I think would be probably categorized as a Swan Maiden story, because she sheds her creature form and with a through a spell and becomes human temporarily, but then in the story, not the Disney movie, but in the story, the Hans Christian Andersen story, she is eventually uh, forced the spell's broken and she has to go back into her creature form. Uh, she becomes a spirit and uh, you know it's it's uh, not really a happy ending to the story um, but usually swan maiden transformed women in these stories um, don't get they don't get a happy ending they don't they don't get to stay human Disney sort of changed the ending <laughs> with Ariel where King Triton's like I got this and he <laughs> transformed her and she was able to live happily ever after but that's not usually how they work another more modern example of a swan maiden story where the um, being human is the spell, being human is the transformation, is one that you've all seen and you all know about, and that is Princess Fiona in Shrek. So Princess Fiona, that's the big spoiler, you know, twist in that movie is, you know, that whole movie is sort of a send-up of fairy tale types and tropes and, and, you know, different stereotypes from folk tales and, and fairy tales and nursery rhymes and all kinds of things. Um, but Princess Fiona's character herself is an enchanted bride. bride. She's an enchanted bride. She's, um, through a spell, has been transformed into uh, another form and then true love has to, you know, restore and break the curse. So, um, the way that Shrek sort of, the movie turns it sort of on its ear is that she's a swan maiden tail type because she her being human is the spell and being an ogre being a creature is her a, her true form right and so in a traditional swan maiden story when the spell is broken and the swan maiden character has to go back into her original form out of being human she loses her true love well, in Shrek, they very intentionally sort of rewrote the, the stereotype of that tail type and made it, well, her true love is also a creature like her, is also a, um, an ogre. And so then they're able to live happily ever after. So that, that was very on purpose, I feel like, in the, in the creators of Shrek. I think they knew exactly what they were doing. But um, just to show you that those kinds of tales are pretty pervasive throughout our culture and people are still sort of playing with them and adding variations onto them. Um, but those are those are all sort of in the broad category of uh, the 400 through 459 uh, transformed uh, beloveds or family members. Uh, but we are talking about uh, something more specific, the animal bride and bridegroom. So let me erase here a little bit. So the, the animal bride and bridegroom can be, there's two main categories within that that uh, we wanna talk about. And that's ATU 420, which we're, I'm only gonna just mention briefly. And then um, ATU 
425, which is what we are reading for our class. So 420, 425. We're going to focus mostly on 425, but I do want to mention a little bit of a difference between uh, 420 and, 4, and, and 420. I know 420 is not the that 420. <laughs> It is it's something totally different. <laughs> so ATU 420 is the one where a human man has lost his wife. Like there's, she has been transformed. She has been taken. You know, there's some spell where um, usually she has been um, like put under a curse or something and has been um, maybe transformed into a bear or transformed into a, a, a hideous monster or transformed into a dragon or, you know, there's all kinds of things. And then the man has to um, look for her. So um, I want I wanted to call attention to some of this wording. So ATU 420 is called Man on a Quest for His Lost Wife, right? Um, and it's, it's within the transformed... Uh, category the the transform so she's not just lost she's been transformed in some way because of, of magic ATU 25 is the opposite where it's a woman whose husband has been lost or transformed and it's called the search for the lost husband um, so various scholars specifically feminist scholars have pointed out the sexist language in those titles where the man when his wife is taken or transformed, he has to go on a quest, which is what heroes do. And the woman, if her husband is lost or transformed, she has to search for him, which is a little bit more aimless and, and like victimizing and helpless, right? If you're, if you're searching for something that's lost, you're a little bit more of a lost, a helpless victim. But if you're going on a quest for something that's lost, it's more heroic and intentional. Um, so some people have sort of pointed out like, oh, that's, that's not cool. <laughs> they don't get, then why doesn't the woman get to go on a quest, <laughs> right? Um, but we're focusing on the second one, um, ATU 425, Search for a Lost Husband. Um, and because it's within the broader category of transformed um, bride and bridegroom and sibling, it is a transformed, um, they were lost because of a spell that they were transformed. So... Uh, I want to talk about the uh, ATU 425, the, ser the search for the lost husband, is further divided into two categories. This is where it doesn't make sense. So you have ATU 425A and you have ATU 425C. There is no 425B. I don't know why. <laughs> it's I don't know why they thought, oh, We'll leave B blank in case there's another category that emerges. I don't know why they didn't do it in order, but it's kind of a weird quirk of the ATU index that in this particular tail type, and there, there are little anomalies like that throughout, but like in this particular tail type, they have just skipped B. Like maybe they're leaving it for later. I don't know <laughs> what, but um, there's ATU 425C, A, ATU 425C, and there's no B. So that's just a little trivia for you. Um, but ATU, uh, we're reading examples from both in this class. So ATU 425A, uh, the, mo the, uh, the first sort of original uh, story, uh, the oldest story in um, the, the 425A group is Cupid and Psyche. Uh, so this is... Uh, well, I, we talked about it in the fairy tales timeline, but it's sort of the oldest literary written down fairy tale that we have. And it is the oldest, like the originator of the Beauty and the Beast uh, tale type. The search for the lost has the transformed husband that the wife needs to go and search for. Um, you will be reading uh, a, a, a later a Scandinavian version of Cupid and Psyche. Um, east of the sun, west of the moon. And this story was in a um, Norwegian uh, fairy tale, folk tale collection. 
here we go. I'll put it if you're a visual person. East of the sun, west of the moon. We're reading this for class. We're reading that tale for class. So um, it is. it belongs to the 425A, and we'll talk more about that. Um, 425C is uh, Beauty and the Beast, the classic story that we know that was originally written in 1700s, mid 1700s. There's a couple different versions in the mid 1700s in France. And, but it was um, based on these earlier tale types, but it was updated and sort of um, altered to not be so harsh. So let's talk about some of the things that they have in common and some of the things that they have that are, um, that what where they diverge, what makes them different. So both of them, both of these tail types have, so there's a, uh, this is on your handout. There's a marriage or they live with, co you know, cohabit or are married to, um, or take it captive by maybe, you know, in Beauty and the Beast, a mysterious non-human figure. Um, in Cupid and Psyche, Cupid is uh, like this, you know, like this godlike creature. He's described differently in different translations and different versions, but he's more just like a voice. She never sees him. Um, she never actually lays eyes on him. Uh, it's, you know, it's something he's, she only feels him next to her in the dark. Um, in the east of the sun, west of the moon, the creature is a polar bear that comes and takes the beauty character away. Um, and we have, you know, Beauty and the Beast. It's a, the beast is described in different ways, but it's just sort of a nondescript animal, lion-y sometimes, but with horns kind of a creature. Um, but anyways, it's, it's a non-human figure who comes in and you know, the, the woman is sort of forced to live with or marry that person. Um, and this is, this is key. There has to be for the events of the story to get going. I guess you could say the catalyst to sort of kick off the narrative is, uh, the why for the girl, the woman has to break a rule. There has to be some sort of a transgression, some sort of a, um, prohibition that she ignores or um, is too tempted to you know and and breaks this this rule um, so in Cupid and Psyche and both East of the Sun West of the Moon it's she is told she cannot ever lay eyes on him when they are in bed together um, in the dark and but she breaks that rule and gets a lamp and looks at him in the in the dark um, and some of the wax drips on him and wakes him up and that's how she's caught in Beauty and the Beast, she's not supposed to ever leave, right? That's the big prohibition. Is she, she's not supposed to ever leave once she gets there. She's She can do whatever she wants once she gets to the castle. She's the mistress of the place, but she can't go back home. You can't go backwards. She can't return to her father and family. And so, um, you know, returning home and uh, wanting to go back and see her family and leaving the Beast castle, that's her big rule break. The Disney one kind of adds... Um, a little bit of an extra transgression where she can't go in the east wing or whatever there's like a wing of the castle that she can't go in and that becomes sort of a big rule that she breaks in the movie version that's not really necessarily a part of the story her in the in the written down versions of Beauty and the Beast her her big rule that she breaks is that she leaves um, the Beast lets her go home because she's worried about her dad so that's not necessarily leaving is not necessarily breaking the rule but the rule that the beauty character in the stories usually breaks is that she stays gone too long. She's said she'd be gone for two weeks and she stays for much longer than that. Um, so it's not returning when she said she was going to return, uh, not keeping her word. Um, that's usually the rule that she's broken, but there's some rule that is broken. And then the woman has to go through some sort of a um, search to recover um, her husband who's been lost or her beloved who's been lost um, and sort of become reunited. Um, in 425A, Cupid and Psyche, East of the Sun, there's all of these like rules, like these tasks uh, that she has to follow. In um, East of the Sun, which we talked about, the one you, you're, you're reading, 
she has to go to the, all of these different women who give her all these tips about, um, you know, they're, they're weaving and spinning and one has an apple and there's all these different things and they have to tell her to go from place to place. She basically has to go this big, huge journey. And then once she gets to where she's going and she finds him, she has to like do laundry real good, right? She has to wash a shirt and prove that she's a good wife. Um, there's, it's a lot more intense and Cupid and Psyche, um, the original, the originator of that tail type, uh, Psyche has to, there's all these different tasks. She has to separate a whole big pot of grains. They're all in different kinds. She has to separate all the different kinds out. Um, and they're in, they're thrown into like the ashes of the fireplace. And then she has to like go get a fleece and it's got to be dry and, but it was out all night. And then she has to go into the underworld and something with ghosts. So it changes. Different people who've told and retold the Cupid and Psyche story throughout the years have sort of changed the, the tasks that she has to do, but there's all different. There's some she has to cr climb a really tall, tall thing and get a thing off of that. And she usually gets help. Like the ants help her separate the grains um, the first time. And like these like birds and things help her get up to the high place. And, you know, there's all, she usually gets help because it's an indicator of her virtue. It's an indicator of her character that the natural world um, sees her plight, sees what she's having to go through, and they have deemed her worthy and of pure heart, and so they aid her in her journey, in her search. Um, so there's usually some kind of a journey. That's 425A. 425C, that's the biggest diversion with 425C is in the Beauty and the Beast stories. There isn't, there aren't tasks like that. Be, uh, beauty does not have to, you know, go through, all, jump through all these hoops and, and complete all these tasks and go on this big long journey. She just has to go home, home to the beast. She has to return to him and she has to find him and she has to um, admit that she cares for him. She has to admit that she has love for him on her own, not because she's been coerced. But she has to agree to marry him, basically. Um, in the story, in the in the movie, the Disney movie, it's "I love you" and the tear. You know, it's all that. In the story, if we'll we'll talk about this in class, but pay attention. She never says that I love him. She says, "I care for him. He would make a good husband. I want to marry him." Because the whole time, she's he asks her every single night, "Will you marry me?" beauty marry me beauty and she's like no you know so her the thing is agreeing on her own will to marry him so those are things that um both of them you know that the, the the two types have in common um is the um the there's a a woman who is is forced to live with or marry a creature um she breaks a rule and has to go through all of these something to help fix the rule she broke. She has to make up for what she did. 425A is a lot more harsh than 425C. 425C has sort of its own um, characteristics uh, that goes with it. Actually, they both have, there's some other things they both have in common that, um, you know, that when we talk about the tales, we can go into a little bit more detail, but um, some things that you know it's a 425 tale is that the woman goes willingly, like the the bride or future bride, the beloved, goes willingly. So she's not necessarily forced. Um, I don't know if I was making that clear. Like, she's not taken captive. Um, the beauty character in both Cupid and Psyche and the East of Sun, West of the Moon and also the Beauty and the Beast stories, there's some sort, she agrees to go. The, there, an offer is made from the creature and she agrees to go. So that's the one thing um, that she agrees to go and live with this with this creature, and there's usually some rule that she breaks, and um, then she has to um, go through something to fix it and fix her mistake. A is with the tasks and the quests and all that. C is just she has to come back and agree to be with him and admit she loves him. It's a lot easier <laughs> in 425C um, than it is in 425A. So. Again, there's lots of different sort of versions of this type of story. Um, and, you know, in class we're going to talk about um, the actual Beauty and the Beast 
story elements in detail the, from the original one. We'll talk more about the actual history of that specific tale in, in class, and then also the um, east of the one, sun, east of the sun, west of the moon. We'll talk about that specific text in class and some textual elements from it. Um, so that's for another time. But for this video, I mainly just wanted to go through and explain what the ATU numbers are and what the ATU index is and just give a little bit of background about how um, you know folklorists and fairy tale scholars and children's lit scholars um, you know how we talk about folk tales and the the system that is used to sort of categorize them and any new stories that are coming out any sort of new um, tale that would count as a fairy tale or or a, a folk tale that's uncovered or discovered um, they all sort of have a place. I don't want you to think, also my last comment I'll make, is I don't want you to think that the ATU index is just for like magical type tales. Um, I think the ATU numbers that cover tales that involve magic are like maybe one through 700 maybe? Like there's, it's like they're a big chunk of them. I think the ATU goes up to, it's over a thousand. It's a, maybe 1200, um, the, the categories uh, of how many there are, how many numbers there are. And the, uh, some of them are just like animal tales, like, you know, three little pigs and, you know, stuff like that. Um, some of them are animals that talk. Some of them are animals that don't you know some of them are um there is a whole swath of just animal tales that don't have any humans in them whatsoever and that's a whole other category um if there is animal tales without humans and so the atu index is not just like magical fairy tale um stories those are just a, a segment of the index so i wanted you to understand that it was a bigger scope than just what we're talking about um it's any kind of story that you can possibly think of um has a you know it has a category um, in the ATU index, uh, a type, if you will, in the index. Um, also, one final thing, the, the index is not perfect. Uh, it's really hard to categorize tales sometimes because some stories have more than one element. Like, yeah, it's a enchanted bridegroom, but then it also has talking animals and you know, it's, yeah, it's a, um, it has magic, but it also has this, or yeah, it has animals, but, you know, so there's, sometimes it's really kind of a head scratcher to figure out why a certain tale was ultimately categorized where it was, and it's, they're not always, to me, a perfect fit, but that's why there's these sort of core elements that each tale type sort of has. There's, you know, the index has a descriptor. This tale type has these sort of markers. And so that's why I was trying to tell you, 425 has these sort of markers. Um, a, a groom or potential groom who has been transformed. A bride or potential bride who goes to live with him or goes to marry him willingly. And she breaks a rule and she has to fix it. Like these are sort of the, the, the benchmarks that any 425 tale will fit. And then there will be other elements that are different and, you know, cultural things that are switched out. Um, just to give you another example, the uh, Cinderella uh, 500A, I think is the Cinderella uh, categorization. Um, and so there are certain core elements to the Cinderella uh, tail type where you have to have a, a, a daughter who is oppressed by her family a lot of times it's the stepmother and stepsisters, but not always. Um, but just a, a a daughter who's oppressed by her family or enslaved by her family. Um, so there's a mistaken identity. Like the, the prince doesn't know who she is, right? There's the mistaken identity. She has to be restored to her rightful place. Um, and there's usually a, um, an a missing like a personal item that is a catalyst in the classic version that we know it's a glass slipper um, in the Chinese Cinderella which is older it was a fur slipper uh, some some stories that are ca categorized as um, Cinderella stories don't have a shoe at all it's it, there's a cloak um, maybe a piece of jewelry some sort of a recognizable um, personal token that restores the the Cinderella character's identity and um 
you know, lets her uh, take her rightful place kind of a thing. So that's what I mean. Like you have these tail types where but you have these sort of boxes that it has to tick to count, but it, it doesn't have to be necessarily um, glass slipper, fairy godmother, st evil stepsisters. You know, that's just maybe a familiar version, but it's not the only one. So that was just another example of how the some stories are categorized in the index, but it's not a perfect system. And some, some of them are kind of, hmm, really there? That's where we're putting it? Okay. <laughs> kind of a thing. It's kind of hard to, hard to figure out. Um, but for now, I think that's all I want to say about the index and, and how um, stories are categorized and just the background of the animal bride and bridegroom uh, category on the index. Uh, you know, when, when we're in class, we'll talk more specifically about Beauty and the Beast and uh, East of the Sun, West of the Moon and uh, you know, some, some more specific elements from the text. So um, until then, I hope you guys have a good week. And if you have any questions, as usual, reach out to me and ask. And I will talk to you later. Bye.